Holly's in the window. Home is where the wind blows. I can't walk for running, cause Christmas time's coming. White candles burning, my old heart's a yearning for the folks at home when Christmas time is coming. Christmas time is coming. Christmas time is coming and I know I'm going home. Can't you hear the bells ringing? Joy, joy, hear them singing. When it's snowing, I'll be going back to my country home. Christmas times are coming, Christmas times are coming, Christmas times are coming, and I know I'm going home. Snowflakes are falling, my old homes are calling, tall pines are humming, Christmas time is coming, everybody, Christmas time. And I know I'm going home Hear yeah, them bells ringing, ringing Joy, joy, hear them singing When it's snowing I'll be going back to my country home One more time Christmas time's coming Christmas time's coming Christmas time's coming And I know I'm going home It's the first Sunday of Advent. Can you believe it? That means you have 20-something days left to get all your shopping done. Isn't that great? Let's stand up and sing, O Come All Ye Faithful. Enduring a few technical difficulties this morning, too. Yeah, you do. O Come All Ye Faithful. Oh, come on. There he is. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come. and take a minute and greet your neighbor and tell him good morning. It's good to see you. Happy Advent.
right? Have you got it in D? Yeah. Deck the halls with boughs of holly Tis the season to be jolly Don we now our gay apparel Fa la 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 Toll the ancient Yuletide carol Fa la 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 See the blazing you before us Fa la 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 Strike the harp and join the chorus. Fa la 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 la. Follow me in merry measure. Fa la 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 la. While I tell of Yuletide treasure. Fa la 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 la. Everybody breathe. Fast away the old year passes. Fa la 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 la. Hail the new year. Lads and lasses, fa la 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 la. Sing we joyous all together, fa la 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 la. Heedless of the wind and weather, fa la 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 la. Deck the halls with boughs of holly. Tis the season to be jolly. Don we now our gay apparel? Fa la 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 la. Toll the ancient Yuletide carol. Fa la 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 la. Oh, you know him so well. You may be seated. to sing Sean's song. Sean was out of town all week too, supposed to be here this morning. You can now refer to him as No Show Jones. 
because all these songs were his, so we've been adjusted on the, on the fly here. So wherever you are, Sean, I have a word for you, but I'm not going to share it publicly. <laughs> time I've ever seen that song. That's Sean's, not mine. So when you see him again, tell him that's not his song anymore. <laughs> that's right, sir. You know it. Check one, two. I'm going, to get, I'm going to begin today by saying thank you. I was observing almost total radio silence last week uh, over the Thanksgiving holiday, but word got back to me that by means of sales and donations, lukewarm in the backsliders, <laughs> raised almost $2,000 last week for, uh, yeah, thank you, for my upcoming trip to Israel. And yes, I am going to Israel, God willing, in late 
late February of 2016. It's a study trip with about 40 other ministers from across the United States. Very excited about the opportunity. And uh, if you wait until the Middle East is a safe place to visit, you'll never go. And when I did the face-to-face -face interview to be included on the trip, safety was the main issue. And the committee asked me, you know, if tensions continue to escalate, will, will you back out? And I said, no, uh, I've been to El Salvador and Honduras and Nicaragua, and those three countries are always swapping titles for murder capital of the world. It's a very competitive race, apparently. <laughs> so I don't think I will, but I'm more concerned, more concerned now about safety than I was months ago when I was first selected for the trip because things have changed a little. Not over there, but over here. Let me explain. One order of business I took care of while I was in Georgia was getting the ball rolling on some additional life insurance on myself. But it's not for my family, it's for you. If you've been in business, you understand this. It's called key personnel insurance. Life insurance for a person within the organization that should they perish unexpectedly, it will get the business through the downturn that would be created by this person's absence. And since we're building this new building, it's a good idea to have yours truly covered because Terry Olive said he wouldn't pay the bill if I died <laughs> suddenly. And in fact, it was Terry Olive who emailed me just before I left town with a gentle reminder to get this done and not to forget it. And then I heard while I was gone that Jeff and Brian did such excellent work in my absence. Thank you, Brian, for, uh, for that. He's here again today that I was told they did so good that my services may no longer be required. <laughs> and so I said, let me get this right. Don't forget to finalize your insurance. Your pinch hitters were so good, we might not need you anymore. And we raised all the money you need to go to the most dangerous <laughs> place in the world in five minutes flat. <laughs> and so I've come home a bit paranoid. And before you get any ideas, I do have the insurance contract, but I have not signed it yet. And I'd hate to have to go to the West Bank or the Sinai Peninsula to feel more secure, but, you know, I feel good about the trip, and I feel very good about Jeff and Brian covering last week again. Thank you so much, and I'm so happy they were received well, and I feel even better about you. Thank you for the help, what you've done, and what you will continue to do. It is a great season of readiness, getting ready to travel to the Holy Land, of course, getting ready to build and then relocate to our new location and getting ready beginning today for Advent. People get ready will be our theme this year for Advent because that's what Advent is, what it means. Advent means arrival, and of course, it is the arrival of the birth of Jesus, God coming to earth in the form of a baby boy, and we look forward during this Advent season and renew our looking forward to His second coming the renewal and rebirth of all things, the heavens and the earth. And now more than ever, that renewal is so badly needed in the world in which we live. And we remind and ready ourselves for what Paul called the blessed hope as well. People get ready. Curtis Mayfield wrote that song. In 1965, though it's been covered by everybody, it's a rarity, the song itself, not all the covers, because everybody seems to sing it, it's a song with clear, redemptive gospel message at its core that has been completely embraced by the rock and roll culture. It's always in the top 25 or at least the top 50 of the greatest rock and roll songs of all time, but Mayfield wrote it as gospel. Curtis Mayfield started singing when he was a kid at his grandmother's church in Chicago, and he learned to play piano, he learned to play guitar, he learned to play every instrument that he could get his hands on, and he joined the Impressions when he was a teenager and hit the road with them. He went on to get involved in the Civil Rights Movement and became close to Dr. Martin Luther King. Dr. King was coming to Chicago to form a protest and to meet with the city leaders, and Mayfield was there to meet King at the train station. People Get Ready came out of Mayfield's wait for Dr. King at that train station. He was waiting for a real train, and writing about a real train, but also about a symbolic train, the train of salvation, the same train that Woody Guthrie sang about in the old 
folk song, This Train is Bound for Glory. Or maybe Ricky Nelson singing The Glory Train. It's a train bringing transformation and redemption, a train that will turn the world upside down. And Mayfield said this song was knocking around in his subconscious the product, quote, of all that preaching of my grandmother and all those Sunday sermons. It's about a train that takes everybody to the promised land. People get ready. There's a train coming. You don't need no baggage. You just get on board all you need is faith to hear the diesels humming. You don't need no ticket. You just thank the Lord. And that's what we're doing. Advent season, waiting at the station, looking down the tracks, listening for the rumble of those diesels, the clickety-clack down the rails, a lonesome whistle in the distance. So thank you, Curtis Mayfield, because that's what Advent is. So with all that said, let's read our text today, the first of the Advent season, a very bizarre text for a Sunday morning reading. Matthew 1, 1 through 17. Bear with me. <clears throat> this is a record of the ancestors of Jesus the Messiah, a descendant of David and of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hez was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Abinadab. Abinadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. Take a breather. David was the father of Solomon whose mother was Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the father of Abijah. Abijah was the father of Asa. Asa was the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was the father of Jeroam. Jeroam was the father of Uzziah. Uzziah was the father of Jotham. Jotham was the father of Ahaz. Ahaz was the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh. Manasseh was the father of Amon. Amon was the father of Josiah. Josiah was the father of Jehoiakim and his brothers born at the time of the exile to Babylon. Take breath number two. After the Babylonian exile, Jehoiakim was the father of Shiltiel. Shiltiel was the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the father of of Abued. Abued was the father of Eliakim. Eliakim was the father of Azor. Azor was the father of Zadok. Zadok was the father of Achim. Achim was the father of Eliud. Eliud was the father of Eleazar. Eleazar was the father of Mathan. Mathan was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Mary gave birth to Jesus, who was called the Messiah. <laughs> and then this editorial note added by Matthew, all those listed above include 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to the Babylonian exile, and 14 from the Babylonian exile to the Messiah. The Word of God for the people of God. We never read chapters like these when I was growing up in church. And maybe some of you have heard some Bible names for the first time today that you had never heard of. Why? Because these texts are boring excruciatingly boring. Who wants to read a census roll? And not only were such texts boring, they are filled with impossible names. You fight the pronunciation almost like every in, almost like an American reporter trying to broadcast the names of the latest terrorists. The vowels just keep piling up. And another reason that we avoided these genealogical records was just as important for we Puritan types. Obviously, sex is involved. <laughs> How else could these people get into the world? And you can't bring that up in church because somebody might go home and try it. <laughs> so the first time in my life I am giving a talk based on this kind of chapter, the begat. At least that's how the King James Bible always interpreted these texts. Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac begat Jacob, so on and so forth. Begat is an archaic English word that nobody's used for 400 years. It means to spawn, to breed, and I'm told that it comes from an old high German word that literally means to make happen. 
Abraham made Isaac happen <laughs> would be the rendering. And people just keep happening until we get to Jesus who made everything happen. And we have begun this day to celebrate that fact. His advent, his arrival into the world, an event that still orders our lives and our calendars after all these centuries. So I haven't chosen this text arbitrarily. This first Sunday of Advent is the Sunday of hope. Nothing says hope like a newborn child. Matthew 1 is about a whole series of children who grow up to have children of their own who eventually in this tall family tree produce the Messiah. From Abraham to Jesus... Is 2,100 years, give or take a decade or two. And every time a child was born, hope was born. There was the sense that this child could be the one. This child could be God's promised Messiah. And on and on it goes, each generation readying itself for that possibility. And just as an aside, it just struck me. Do you know what Matthew did for a living before he was a disciple? He was a tax collector. Leave it to a tax collector to know every person that has lived for 2,100 years and probably what they owed in back taxes when they died. Thank God Matthew was saved from that lifestyle. It's a long, long chain, a long train, a long time coming. And you know the major players. Abraham. Jacob, David, maybe Hezekiah, you may have heard of him. These are the big, strong limbs that are hanging on the family tree of Jesus. But there are some lesser-known people, some people obscure that you may have heard for the first time today. Some that we know nothing about. Some who are just plain crazy. I told my sister this past week, nothing brings siblings together like crazy parents. If your family is normal, bless you. I have no idea what that means. I don't think any family is normal. Every family is dysfunctional. It's only a matter of degree. Every family. And if you think your family is right and good, well, bless your heart. Because you're probably going to really mess up your children. I mean, don't you look at some of the people in your family and say, we really share the same chromosome? Can I get a DNA transplant? Is that, is that possible? I mean, I don't shake my family tree too hard because the nuts fall out of it. And, and Jesus had the same situation. There's some really, if we had the time, and we don't today, but if we went play by play through some of these names, it would astound you. I, I mean, their family gathers must have been must have been something when they got to talking about the old days with what some people do. Here's a couple references. There's a reference here to a man named Judah and a woman named Tamar. Tamar was Judah's daughter-in-law. Twice. Because his sons kept dying and she kept getting the next one. That son ultimately died and she ended up bearing Judah's son herself only after posing as a prostitute to get the deal done. How do you like that one? That son is a direct ancestor of Jesus. Then there's Rahab. She ran the house of the rising sun in Jericho. Go read her story. She's another one of those wicked women of the Bible. Her son, likewise, is a great-great-grandfather of Jesus. And then there's the greatest, most scandalous story of all. It's David, King David. David and this woman Bathsheba. I'm not stretching it when I say that Bathsheba was David's midlife crisis. Go read the text. He's at home at the palace while his army is away doing his work. Kind of depressed. Feeling blue about getting older. Looks out across the city. He sees Bathsheba taking a bath. What she's doing, taking a bath on a roof, I don't know. (laughs) They have this torrid love affair. But she turns up pregnant. 
That's why we never brought up genealogies in church. And David had to get rid of her husband. One of his officers in his army. David. The saintly King David puts her husband, Uriah, on the front line of the next battle. And when they engage the enemy, the entire line retreats and leaves him there to be assassinated. And with him out of the way, David moves Bathsheba into the palace, into his harem. Her eventual son, Solomon, would succeed his father as king of Israel. A scandalous child, and also one in the direct lineage of Jesus. How in the world could God entrust the incarnation to people like these? <laughs> he seems to have more faith in humanity than humanity has in him. Because he just stayed with them. Kept counting on them to work it out and work it through. We'll reach some stage of the game where the conditions will be right and the right people will be in place and then in the fullness of time, a great biblical word that Paul uses, in the fullness of time, then Jesus would be born. I don't know why he did it, but that's really what hope is. Hope endures. Hope sticks with it. Hope bets on what will be, not on what is. Hope believes that something good can come out of something terrible. Hope trusts that at least there is redemption in all the messiness of our lives, our families, all that goes wrong. And as it relates to Jesus, and I read those names intentionally, those long list of names, as it relates to Jesus, each person's name that we read about in this sprawling genealogy is another boxcar in that train, another tanker, another coach on that glory train. They are not random names. Every person is a product and instrument of hope that led eventually to Jesus, and only those at the end, only those riding on the caboose ever saw it come to pass. All the other ones die never knowing how it works out, but it worked out. Hope is resiliency. It keeps us from being victims. And it forces us to see that we are a part of something much larger than ourselves. Well, I run a brothel in Jericho. Well, so what? Get ready, because good things are coming. But I had this sordid affair that broke up a home and my lover killed my husband. Well, as soon as Dateline finishes telling your story, come on down to the station and get on the train. I will never amount to anything in this life. Can't you see that? Well, maybe, maybe not. You don't know what's going to end up with your life or in the lives of those who follow you. Hope is all that is good and whole and redemptive and healing in the final and complete restoration of all things, even the things that humanity has derailed and interfered with. The tracks were laid down that first Christmas and it will be complete when Christ comes again, and you are a part of that, and I am a part of that, and we have the opportunity to live in the light of hope that gives us a future. And buddy, this world could use a strong dose of hope. That as things are today, are not how they always will be. If Advent doesn't say that, Advent says nothing. Maybe it works like this. In 1981, there was a businessman named Eugene Lang. And he returned to his elementary school, public school number 121, that he attended five decades earlier in East Harlem. He was there, I love this, to give the commencement address for the graduating sixth grade class. The reason they gave a commencement for the sixth graders is that 75% of those would never graduate from high school. They told Lang that as he was preparing to step to the podium. And he asked the principal, well, if 75% are going to drop out, how many of these kids are going to go to college? One. Well, he was heartbroken by that, but at the same time immediately motivated. And he threw his notes aside, 
And he stood up and he said this, If you will graduate from high school, I will personally pay your college tuition. There were 61 kids in the room. And now, for the first time, they had hope. Real hope. What did it cause them to do? It caused them to work harder than they would ever have worked if they did not have that hope. It caused them to change their plans. It caused them to apply themselves. Because now they realized they were a part of something bigger, that their life could improve, that there was some redemption out there for them. Six years after that impulsive promise, 90% of that class graduated from high school. 60% went on to go to college. And Lane kept his promise. He paid the tuition for every kid that went to college and hundreds of kids after because it was such a success he started something called the Dream Foundation. These were his dreamers. And over these last years, he has paid the college tuition of poor city kids all over New York. If you'll just get there, get to the finish line, do your part, and I will do the rest. And today, of that original 61 kids, their kids today are graduating from college themselves. That's how it works. That's how hope works. People get ready for the train to Jordan. Picking up passengers from coast to coast. Faith is the key. Open the doors and board them. There's hope for all among the loved and the lost. Amen and amen. Pray with me if you would. Lord, our despairing and desperate world needs hope, as does our despairing and desperate hearts. You promised hope to your people, and you have kept that promise all these years. You promised hope in the coming of a son, and after the many years you brought him forth, born of a virgin and laid in a manger. Fill us with the confidence of your presence in our lives, and may that presence give us Christ, we pray. Amen. Who is serving communion today? Is there a lighter over there? Let's light today the candle of hope. It is one of the purple candles. And it will be relit each week and then joined by the, the candles to follow, candles that represent hope, joy, love, and peace, and then Christmas Eve. We light the Christ candle as we honor the arrival of Jesus. I invite you to the Lord's table to come and let us celebrate the, the gift of God's hope and grace to the world.
pray today, please remember Ed Stewart. Ed has been um, courageously bat battling cancer for this last year. He had major surgery in recent days to remove a tumor off of his liver. Was it off of his liver and abdomen? Massive, larger than his liver itself. 
and uh, it's a, he's just a miracle at this point in reco- recovering well from that surgery. Also, pl- pray for uh, Julia Skinner, who put capital L in labor in the birth of Avery Elizabeth Skinner, born Thanksgiving Day. And uh, Julia had some complications thereafter, but is doing well now. Is that right, John? Outstanding, outstanding. So uh, I guess we should pray for Dad, too. But let's, let's remember the Skinners. We're so thankful both for the birth of the baby and now the recovery for Julia. Let's join hands together as we pray. Lord, we do give you praise for the recovery, both of Ed and Julia, and pray that you would speed that recovery and and that they would continue to improve and be ready to enjoy this Advent and holiday season and be able to give thanks to you for all good things, as we do today, not the least of which is this season of the year. We hold other requests up to you that have not been mentioned out loud, but we know and you know so well and ask that you be near us all with your grace and your presence and your power in this world in which we live. As Jesus has taught us to pray, we pray boldly. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hey, Bobby Rains, are there still lukewarm in the backslider CDs available? Barbara's got them. This is Barbara right down here. Stand and wave. She's got all the CDs you can buy. Yes, ma'am. Third, the third Saturday. Got it in 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 the, in the vault. It is. It's a lot of fun. It is genuinely. <laughs> With security in place. This is not Black Friday. Anybody go shopping Black Friday? It wasn't bad? It wasn't. You're from Chicago? Oh, you didn't have to knife anybody or anything, did you? That was great. Awesome, awesome. Oh, come all you faithful after that terrible comment by me. Let's stand up and sing it again. Oh, come all ye faithful. Joyful and triumphant, O oh, come ye, O oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels, O oh, come. Oh, 
Sunday.